Good evening and welcome to the May 8th uh, regular, uh, regular meeting of the East Chester Fire District. Uh, we started tonight's uh, meeting at 6.30, immediately went into executive session. Uh, the time is now 7.48. Uh, we're going to begin tonight's meeting with our treasurer's report from our treasurer, Jamie Hedstrom. I can't see anybody. <laughs> um, all right, so today we're looking at the budget through April 30th. Um, the financials currently are presenting a net budget surplus of approximately $215,000. Um, this is primarily related to three items. Um, the first is our insurance, um, because we didn't receive any invoices in the first quarter uh, of the year as we had budgeted for. However, as of today, we've received them. Um, the, the CERT claims, we've received notification from the town from still from last year and this year of over $160,000 of settlements that are pending. Um, but however, for whatever reason, very few have settled. I don't know if they're rolling another year into them at this point or what. So we, we haven't paid out as many CERTs as we would have expected to by this point in the year. Um, and then uh, our fire equipment and capital outlay. Um, last year when we did the budget, we changed the amount we were budgeting to put into the reserve to money we would actually expend this year. Um, and we just, because we have been focused on using our reserves first, we haven't uh, used this yet. Um, so that's really going to make up the, the reason you're seeing a surplus. Um, however, again, it's not significantly high. Um, we did talk, I mentioned last month we were going to potentially look at budget transfers at this month's meeting. Um, we decided to hold that off um, likely for next month's meeting because we've been, um, you know, doing a, a quite a detailed analysis on the overtime, which is one of the lines in question. And really other than that, we're, n we're not um, over too many places. Uh, you know, we mentioned last month that the uniform budget is over for the year. We, we anticipated that that could happen, but other than that, there's nothing significant right now that has to be done, so uh, we're going to hold off on that until probably next month. Um, as far as other matters, we did receive our final audit reports. Um, they are available in the front office. They're available through FOIL for anybody who is interested in seeing our audited financials. Um, I just heard from the town today we will be receiving our uh, tax monies this Friday, May 11th. Um, we're scheduled to receive 100% of the tax monies. Um, and then one thing that's come up between last meeting and this meeting uh, has to do with our reserve funds, uh, which I know the board is going to talk about in detail later. Um, just, uh, you know, having gone through the process of expending money from our reserve and then looking at the way it was formed in more detail, um, we've had some recommendations by our law firm, uh, you know, to meet the current requirements of the OSC on how our reserve should be set up. Um, so I know there'll be some resolutions later tonight. Um, and the focus being that the reserve we have now is going to be earmarked for capital improvements specifically um, and talking about, you know, whether or not we need a reserve for apparatus at this time. Historically, we had one reserve account and, you know, based on reading new guidance that's out there, that's not necessarily the correct approach and that's what we're going to be working on tonight. Okay. Uh, we're actually going to launch right into that because since you raised the issue, okay. uh, why wait? So, can, can uh, I just ask Jamie one question on her report? Sure. Did we supply the two villages in the town copies of the audited financials? No, we have not yet. So we'll do we that have, this week. We have to send that off. It, and it did go to the OSC, but I'll submit it to the town this week. Okay. Okay, so uh, in 1971, uh, the district created a reserve fund, which was named the Capital Reserve for Capital Improvements. And at the time, the intention was that money was going to be reserved in that account for repairs to our firehouses. Uh, in 2001, uh, the fire district attorney at that time recommended that we rename that account to the House and Apparatus Fund. And that has been the name of that fund since, and we've been reserving monies for both the purchase of uh, fire trucks, fire, you know, engines, ladders, as well as for repairs, renovations to our firehouses. Uh, as part of the process of moving money from that reserve uh, to make a payment on the three new fire engines we recently purchased, our attorneys, uh, kind of surprisingly to me, uh, realized that uh, this reserve fund has a dual purpose to both uh, reserve monies for house repairs and for apparatus repairs. 
Apparently, this is a, a no-no under general municipal law and also against New York State OSC guidelines. Uh, they have recommended that we immediately uh, rescind the uh, resolution that was passed in 2001 and return the reserve to its original name and have it just be earmarked for house repairs and renovations only. Uh, that reserve currently has $1.7 million in it. Uh, I think that uh, we, we, we're gonna get into this in a little bit, uh, but we recently awarded our Chester Heights exterior project. Uh, the cost of that project is gonna be 452,000. Uh, we are then going to embark on the interior work that needs to be done in that firehouse. We anticipate that that work is going to cost us between 1.25 and 1.75 million. Again, we'll discuss that in a little more detail later on. But that fund, basically, the money in that fund is is earmarked for those uh, renovations and will likely be spent over the course of the next uh, 12 months. Uh, why I'm going to propose a motion to change that name uh, shortly. The question now becomes, though, is what do we want to do about reserving for uh, apparatus going forward? Uh, we can create uh, an additional reserve account to reserve monies just for, uh, for future purchases of apparatus. If we do, uh, that has to go to a, a vote. So at our election uh, this coming December, that would be on the ballot, voter approval to create that reserve. Uh, I would say that historically we've carried uh, larger reserve balances than I believe is, is prudent for this fire district. And it is my hope that uh, a lot of that has to do with the fact that we, we had the need to make repairs and buy apparatus, but, and we had the money, we were reserving it, but for various reasons, it just didn't happen. And so this money continued to build. Uh, it, you know, I, I think that it's, it's worked against us uh, for several reasons, which when I open it up for discussion, maybe we'll, we'll talk about. But I, I don't believe that going forward it will be necessary to have a separate reserve uh, just for apparatus purchases. I think we can fund down payments on future apparatus purchases out of our general fund. Uh, but that is something that the board is going to uh, debate and consider, and we may look to create an additional reserve in December. So it, it, at this point, I guess I'll open it up to the board if anybody has any other comments that they'd like to make on the subject. Well, I think we have a high class problem, basically, um, in a sense that we have no debt. If you got your tax bill from the last month from the town, you notice the fire district had zero tax increase. But more importantly, if you look at the back of our order, the financials, which were just published, you will find no debt, no leases, no uh, liabilities, uh, and a, a strong, maybe too strong of a balance sheet. If you go ever since the tax cap was passed about seven years, five years ago, whatever it was, municipalities pretty much have lived under the cap and they've hid all their uh, expenditures over the cap in the back of the balance sheet via borrowings, you know, where they borrowed money, uh, call it bonding, leasing, whatever. There's a whole cottage industry now for that. And so you're, you're, most of your municipalities, the back of the balance sheets, the last final pages where the footnotes are, which are the most important part of a financial statement, is all the debt. And so um, I think from... Our point of view, we, we have a high class problem having the balance we have, and, and the chairman's right that spending it is important and we need to spend it. Um, we may bump against the WIC floor in that Chester Heights house if we go above a million and a half dollars. But um, yeah, I, I would hope that we come back and in the fall come back with an apparatus reserve fund because in the next 15 years, if we had to replace all our apparatus 15 years from now, because the average life is about 15 years, I think firemen will tell you first line apparatus should be changed in 10 years. We generally run it to 15 years. Um, 15 years for $6 million is about $300,000 a year in depreciation. So I think it's fair to set aside some money uh, for that apparatus after we dwindle our accounts down. Um, also, there is an argument that bonding spreads the cost more evenly or fairly over the taxpayers. 
That is true when you renovate buildings. It's not true when you buy apparatus that is utilitarian in nature. The fire trucks that are going to respond to calls a year from now when we get our brand new equipment, for all practical purposes, other than having softer seats inside and maybe some brighter lights outside, are going to have the same pumping capacity, the same pretty much everything on them that we have today. Uh, so it's not like the, the taxpayer is getting some advantage having this piece of apparatus roll up to their house other than the fact that it's newer. Whereas you, when you get municipal buildings renovated and you use reserve funds to do that, the resident that moved out had paid for a building that somebody's using that's been completely modernized that they didn't have a chance to have. So I think with building repairs, bonding is probably appropriate for apparatus funds when you buy very similar equipment that you're replacing. I don't know if that really is the argument. So I would hope we come back with a reserve fund. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I guess probably don't want to get too much because we're going to debate this further. But, you know, the counter argument there could also be that, you know, we, res we earn 0.15 of 1% on our reserve balances. So carrying large balances for extended periods of time is not really a great use of that capital. Uh, I also don't think that we should be reserving to pay for apparatus in cash the way we did on these purchases. We have the money, so we're doing it that way. I have no, no problem reserving a set amount uh, for down payments, uh, that kind of thing, but building up these very large reserves that earn very little money, I think create problems for a number of reasons. A, it makes us uh, seem wealthier, uh, it, it exposes perhaps our, the wealth of, of the district and may hurt us in contract negotiations uh, for one. And meanwhile, it, it, it doesn't, I take that back because sometimes it gives us the appearance of wealth as it did recently when we built these balances up to high levels without the public having a full understanding that our average fire truck is 18 years old or the floor is caving in in our Chester House fire house, you know, house or our, our, our buildings in general are in desperate needs of repair. So I, I think that's, you know, an important uh, reason for doing it. You know, the other thing is, is that, listen, you always hope that you get good, smart, prudent boards up here who are going to make good decisions. But sometimes if you've got a lot of money sitting in a reserve account, not always the smartest decisions are made. You know, people look to buy, you know, equipment apparatus that the district doesn't need. I mean, we currently today uh, decided collectively as a board to, uh, to auction off a, a truck that we have that has a generator in the back. I mean, we spent some money for that. We spent money buying the generator, buying the truck, putting the generator in the back of the truck. That thing is sat in Chester Heights Firehouse, and I don't think it's been used more than once. No. And now we're selling it. No. So let me, let me finish. I got the floor. So I, I just want to be careful that just because money is, in, is there in abundance, uh, it's not used wastefully. I want, you know, taxpayer, I want this board to evaluate every purchase that's made in great detail and, and really have to think about, you know, the consequences of the spending that they're, they're making. So uh, Dennis made some legitimate points, and I'll agree that, you know, that they are valid. And we'll, we'll discuss it further, but that's, that's my two cents on the issue. So I'm just going to comment on the generator truck to correct that a, a bit. The generator truck has a very large diesel generator in the back that came out of a rescue. We had a Brockwork, I think it was a Brockwork rescue years ago, right, that had a Brockway, Brockway yeah. rescue that had a a uh, particularly large generator in it, and the ch mechanic at the time, John Lucenti, uh, took that generator and repurposed it with very little cost into the back of an old pickup truck, a 1979 pickup truck, which was at the time a, a, just a very old pickup truck, and the department did spend a few thousand dollars putting a little cover on it, and, but basically there's no money, on, not, no any real money was spent on that truck. That truck did power the East Chester Police Department a few years ago when they had a problem, and it did power the Bronxville Police Department a few years ago when it has a problem when they lost their power. And it's been a standby vehicle that could power a large building if needed to. The unfortunate part is, you know, when you have these blackouts, people don't ask for it, but it's a very powerful truck for generator capacity. Okay. Anyone else have anything they want to add on the subject, or are we good? All right, so I'm going to read, uh, I'm going to make a motion, and uh, I'll read it and see if anyone wants to sec second it. 
resolution to rescind a resolution to establish Capital Reserve Building and Apparatus Fund from October 11, 2001 meeting, which sought to rename and combine accounts and thus return the reserve fund's name to its original name, a capital reserve fund for the capital improvements for the town fire district of the town of East Chester, New York, as set forth in the October 14, 1971 resolution. So basically what we're doing is we're rescinding the renaming from 2001 and going back to the name that was originally created as. Do I get a second? I'll second it. Okay, I'll pull the board. Stu. Aye. Anthony. Aye. I'm an aye. Dennis. Aye. And Tom. Aye. Okay, motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next up, we will uh, pay the bills. Uh, we have uh, three sets of warrants. Uh, the first set of warrants is dated 4-26-2018, totaling $229,345.42. The second set of warrants is dated 5-18-2018, totaling $83,343.78. And we also have a credit card bill dated 5-18-2018 in the amount of $256.81. Uh, the bills total $312,946.01. Uh, do I have a motion to pay the bills? Motion. Second. Okay, I'll pull Aye. the board. Okay. Stu? Aye. Anthony? Aye. I'm going to abstain because we had a jam-packed session there and I didn't get to review them, uh, but the rest of the board did. Uh, Tom? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Uh, next up is uh, Chief Tween's monthly report. Thank you, Commissioner. <coughs> Uh, the monthly activity report for April 2018, total alarms was 276, fire calls 11, uh, 153 EMS or rescue calls, and we gave out mutual aid two times, once to Mount Vernon and once to Hartsdale Fire Department. I spoke to Dr. Reddy this week, and he's going to begin the department medicals starting this month. Um, the vehicle maintenance continues with the use of outside vendors. Um, and as the board mentioned, I would like to surplus three vehicles um, that we spoke about last month. A 1979 GMC pickup truck, a 2000 Ford Crown Victoria four-door sedan, and a 2001 Chevy Suburban. Um, there used to be spare vehicles, and now those vehicles have been replaced, so they're spares to the spares. So they're really not needed anymore. And to get rid of them, to get them off the insurance, I'm asking the board's permission to put them on a... Uh, surplus website. Or the board approved it in an executive okay. session, so go okay. forward with that. Very good. Uh, the station boiler water leak at station, uh, the boiler at station four is getting worse. Uh, Tim had to go down there today. I didn't get a report on what's going on, but there's more water in the boiler room, so we're going to have to shut that off very shortly, uh, hopefully Some for the here. season and for yeah. good. Why is it on? Uh, it's, you know, you could get a cool day if it's raining and it's 50 degrees out, you know, the guys are going to need heat. So until it hits June, I'm anticipating we'll probably keep it up and running. So. And how about uh, the hot water? A separate hot water heater yeah, for that. I, I mean, we can shut it yeah, off today. I don't, uh, get, let's get a space heater for that back room if that's, okay. but I mean, I've turned the heat off in my house upstate. It's cooler up there than it is down here. I don't. Okay. Uh, I was waiting to hear what Tim saw. He went down there late this afternoon and I didn't hear back from him. It'd be like New York City. Most leases are May 15th. The air conditioning comes on and the heat goes off. Assume the go. air conditioning's on now. Open the door. Okay, so, but we know that once it gets shut off, we're going to have to replace it before the heating season starts. Yes. Okay. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Sure. Uh, maintenance mechanic Dalton has been busy with numerous painting jobs, fixing roof leaks and plumbing issues. I feel he's done an outstanding job organizing the shop in the rear of Station 1. Uh, he's constantly going to the scrap yard and bringing Jamie lots of cash back from uh, old couplings that we recycle and old copper and things that are laying around that uh, never were uh, gotten rid of. Uh, so I think Tim's doing a great job. Fire prevention and code enforcement continues with numerous plan reviews and inspections. On uh, May 19th, Saturday, May 19th, at East Chester Town Hall, there's going to be a safety day that the fire department will attend and perform a demonstration of a vehicle extrication uh, with the assistance of EVAC, who will demonstrate patient packaging and uh, also Captain Pinaval will uh, have the smoke trailer there and he'll demonstrate what to do if a smoke alarm goes off. Uh, Captain Pinaval will also be hosting a college dorm safety lecture for the Bronxville High School senior class as he does every year for the students going off to college. 
Uh, if any other schools wanted that program, they could contact us and he'd be more than happy to provide it. But so far, Bronxville has been the only one to uh, request it. Um, that we should emphasize again, that is an important class for people sending kids off to college. Um, and Bronxville is diligent about it because they had a tragedy about 10 years, 15 years ago already now with a kid off, who, uh, a child went off to college. I lost a good friend of mine in college who died in a fire. So, um, you know, a dorm room fire. So, I mean, it's important for people to know what this, how fast smoke can fill a room in that trail. It teaches you that. And if you're around on May 19th and you have your kids and you want to show them that trailer, it's a really unique experience inside that trailer. Um, maybe I'll proactively contact the other two school districts and see if they're interested. They may not know that the program exists, so I'll contact the East Chester and Tucko school districts about that program. Uh, we've been doing hazmat tech refresher training uh, in-house. Uh, several of the members were certified with the New York State Instructor Authorization, so that's something we used to have the state come down and do. They don't want to do that anymore. They have a shortage of instructors, so they offered a instructor authorization class, and we had, I believe, five members attended that. So we're doing our hazmat training in-house now. Uh, Captain Calby is working on the training for the albuterol program for asthma patients, um, and hopefully by the end of the month, all the training will be completed and the albuterol will be on the fire trucks. Um, the radio contract that was approved last month was signed and has been renewed. Um, and I mentioned to the board there's a problem with the Station 2 hose tower roof. I think the board members may have discussed it, uh, so I'll leave it at that. And on May 23rd and May 24th, uh, I signed up to attend a seminar uh, for PERMA up at the Sagamore Hotel in Bolton Landing. Uh, PERMA will pay for one night of the hotel, and I'm requesting for approval to be reimbursed for a second night, which would be the night before, because it starts at 8 o'clock in the morning up at Lake George. Um, so the extra night of hotel would be $199, and I'm also asking to be reimbursed gas and tolls. I'll take my own car up there. Uh, the credit card policy specifically says that the fire department credit card cannot be used for travel expenses, so that's why I'm asking to be reimbursed on my own credit card to go up there to that. I have no problem with that. Anybody have any issues? No, it's a good All idea. Right. Yeah, you're good. Okay, thank you. And yes. uh, Chief, last month you sure. brought up an ID maker. Then it yes. said it was a good idea to have an ID maker. I went and looked at the IDs that we have on our, you know, Google Drive, mm -hmm. and uh, we need. I kind of think we need to buy a ID. I, I know there's some been emails back and forth, but I think we should buy an ID maker. I think it's about fifteen hundred dollars. I think I have the invoice in here. Uh, Sixteen hundred and forty-nine dollars to get one. Um, I just don't. I think it's one of those things you need to have as we we have m members who don't have IDs right now. Some of them have expired. Some people Most have been promoted have that have not been issued new ones at their new rank. So <laughs> I'm just coughing dry. So um, I don't know how many of the other board members feel. I know um, I would make a motion that we spend the $1,650 to buy the ID maker. Does anybody else have an opinion on this? Where did Stu go? Oh, there he is. You were leaning back, I didn't see you yeah, there. Yeah. Anybody else think we should buy ID Maker? I'll or? second that motion. Okay, any discussion? I would, I would say that it would possibly be worthwhile for us to look at the other emergency services locally and see what they do and if there's a way to piggyback through their already established technology. I know that the East Chester Police Department does IDs for employees and police officers aside from badges. Uh, possibly EVAC would be a company that would be interested in implementing the program and kind of offset the cost of buying such a machine. Sure. If that would be something yeah. that, you know, the board would be interested in looking into. But I think if, if we buy, I, I agree with that. If, if we buy one, I think we should be trying to, you know, uh, rent it out to other, you know, local government entities. It, to me, the, listen, 1600 bucks is not a lot of money in the grand scheme of things. My issue with it is, We've got, you know, approximately 75 firefighters, five board members, uh, two in our administrative staff. If everybody got IDs, we're doing that once, and then we're doing it again three years later. The chief has mentioned that, you know, we could use it to create tags for some of our equipment, but to me, you know, for something that's gonna get that kind of use every three years, by the time we go for the second round of use on it, it's gonna be out of warranty. You know, 
I just think it's something that you would either uh, share that resource with a, a you know another entity, or you know buy one and and you know either control the sharing or participate with somebody else who already has one. And I would agree with Stu that I would you can look into that in time for the June meeting and make a decision. I agree, yeah. I agree with you. But I I think what you have to understand is the hours that the firemen work at the fire district. If you had a building that had 75 employees in it, you could say, okay, on Friday we're going to have everybody get their IDs and the people would walk in the room, they'd print the IDs and you'd have it done in a day. Our firemen work once every four days, 77 days a year on average. So the, you would have that need that machinery there to get everybody in a rotation <clears throat> probably for two months straight to catch everyone. I, uh, I, it's... That's you can the buy them works. online, and when guys come in, the chief puts out an order. Every captain has to put them in front of that white screen. Boom, picture's taken. It's on take the computer. Two, take them two months to get everybody. I, I understand what you're saying, but I think the discussion is more about the number of employees in total that we have, not how long it would take to get them ID'd up. But the machine does more than that. It'll create tags you can put on radios and that type of thing. It's, it's a, the chief is requesting a tool that costs $1,600 to make it. To me, he should just buy it and move on and not bring it to the board for a $1,600 item. That's just my way of thinking. So to me, it's a little bit of micromanagement to, I mean, I last month questioned <coughs> the, um, to have, <coughs> excuse me, the tape ability. So, Excuse me, I gotta get a drink of water. No, I'm okay. Well, I'm right back. The majority of the group has to move forward with that. I don't think I'm, I'm fine with it. Chief, what's your thoughts on, on the. I haven't looked into the police departments. 15 years ago, the guys would go up to Lake Isle and get a picture. Right. It was yeah. not a very professional ID card, it didn't look official in any way. Before that, we used to have just little index cards with your thumbprint on it. And so I'm just looking for something that makes a professional ID. Right. I haven't so spoken to the police my department. My question so. so is what, what is your thoughts about this actual model? It, it seems like it's a pretty professional one. Uh, Lisa researched it and yeah, it's, you know, it seems like it's good. And, um, but it may be a good idea to contact one of the police departments because I'm sure they have professional looking ID I mean, cards. Would you benefit, you think, from just one month that if we say we'd like to make a decision on this in June to do a little bit extra research around and come back with something that you think is appropriate. Yeah, I think one month is, is that, fine. Yeah, is that's, that not, a, that's not a problem. Sure. And we can kind of discuss this in June and sure. say whether or not, I, I don't think the mechanics of, of what it, the, the use is the issue. And like Peter said, I don't think it's the cost either. It's the idea of getting something and then putting it on the shelf after six months. Mm -hmm. And how many times you're going to change tabs on labels? I mean, I'm sorry, labels on radios right. when they fall off, or they become well, we burnt change off, the frequencies, yeah, which like doesn't that. happen very often. Right. But, you so know. I, I personally don't have a problem with owning a machine or um, jointly owning a machine. Mm -hmm. But if the month's okay, yeah. do your research what you think is right, and we can table it for June. That's fine. Is that fair? Yeah. That's yeah. It will take a real interest in putting it in closing the matter. Yeah. Uh, Chief, we had, um, okay, we'll move on with that till June. But wait a minute, you got a motion on the floor? You got a motion. So so okay, I'll withdraw my motion. Okay. okay. And then we'll look to, to, to close the matter in June mm -hmm. and take the time to get everything in order. That'd be perfect. Chief, in the past, we've um, limited your overtime to 12 hour bites, to hand out 12 hour bites. Um, the board is reconsidering that, uh, wondering if it would be easier for you at your discretion to use 24-hour bites or 12-hour bites at your discretion to hand them out. I think there's a general consensus on the board that 24 hours is uh, appropriate for some a window right now. Um, it'll save me time. It'll be half as many phone calls, but sometimes it's harder to give out 24 hours of overtime because somebody, you know, may not be available. Your, your discretion. Night. So, so you yeah, do it that way. Great. Yeah, that would be great. To 12. Sure. So yeah, I think we wanted to limit this until uh, our probationary firefighters finish and come online. Okay. And then we'll go back to the old uh, process. But, okay. Uh, until then. We should. Well, maybe uh, through the summer. Like, do it to September 1st? I think, yeah, we were saying August 31st or a specific day. Because who knows what may transpire with anybody in the academy right now. I mean, you can find yourself, for whatever reason, short or mm -hmm. for some reason they don't come onto the job. 
we'll extend it right. if, the, if the situation wasn't to change. So we can do that through September 1 or August 31st, whichever one sounds okay. more apt. So, Dennis, you making a motion to... I don't know we if just we need a motion. Or are we making a motion, making a motion to just, allow it? The chief can just... Okay. Yeah. We're all in agreement. Okay. Uh, approval of minutes. Uh, Secretary Gutierrez has prepared the minutes for the board meetings held on the following dates. January 11, 2018, the regular board meeting, which all of us attended. January 11, 2018, award ceremony, uh, which all of us attended. The April 10th, 2018 meeting, which all of us attended. And a special meeting held on April 18, 2018, which was attended by myself, Commissioner Roche, and Commissioner Laurie. Uh, the minutes have been distributed. People had an opportunity to comment. I'd like to make a motion to pass, accept the minutes. Do I get a second? Second. Okay. And I'll pull the board. Stu? I'll abstain. Okay. Okay. Uh, Anthony? Aye. I'm an aye. I'm going to abstain because I haven't read them all. Okay. And uh, Tom? I haven't seen them either. You they guys read the, your email? <laughs> they were on the email, weren't they? Yeah. Okay. All right, we're going to okay, approve those vote. next month. No, no, no. I no, no, approve no. them. I did read All right, them. well, well the, we, we're not going to carry the motion, but right. you guys said they're, okay. on the, they're on the email. She sent they're them. They're on the so. email. That's what my, I saw. My abstention was due to my absence. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, speaking of the special meeting, uh, on April 18th, we held a special meeting at the headquarters to award our Chester Heights facade and window restoration project to BJB Construction Corp. BJB is located in Bedford, New York, and submitted a bid of $452,780. Uh, the board, our architectural and engineering firm, and our attorneys conducted due diligence on this firm and concluded they were the lowest responsible bidder, and therefore they should be awarded the project. Uh, BJB intends to start work in May, and the estimated completion time is four months. Uh, the board also passed a resolution authorizing the use of funds in our capital reserve fund, our house and apparatus fund, to pay for this project. Uh, that authorization is subject to a 30-day waiting period, permissive referendum, uh, permissive referendum uh, to allow for public comment. Uh, I'd like to make a, a quick comment about uh, this project. Uh, you know, the board initially put this project out in 2016. It was a larger in scope. It included the roof work that we did this uh, past fall, as well as the work that we just awarded. Uh, when we put the bid out, while we had a lot of people show up to the walkthrough and indicate that they were going to bid, uh, when it came down to it, we received one bid, and that bid was for $2.1 million which was substantially above the estimated cost of the work. Uh, the board decided to reject it. It was a smart move. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, we decided to uh, broaden the base of, of bidders, and given the fact that the roof was in desperate shape, uh, we put just the roof out for bid. Uh, we had good participation, very strong bid. We got that roof completed for $400,000, just under $400,000. Uh, we now are doing the balance of the work, and the winning bidder is doing that work for $452,000. So $850,000 is what ultimately we're paying to get the exterior restoration done on that building when the initial bid to do it was $2.1 million. So, uh, you know, clearly we, we you know, uh, pay close attention to what uh, not just the budgets, the estimated, you know, budgets for these projects. We make sure that they are realistic, and when they don't make sense, uh, we reject it. It required a fair amount of time on the part of the board members. Uh, we had to pay additional fees for engineer, architects, engineering, and attorneys' fees, but those fees were very small relative to the, you know, $1.3 million lower. So now looking forward, uh, we need to, after uh, we're done with the exterior work, we need to address in extremely poor condition. Uh, we have asked FSI Architecture, our current, uh, the, the A&E uh, firm that worked on the exterior, to prepare a proposal for the interior work on the building. 
This would include removal and replacement of the apparatus floor, which is severely damaged, uh, renovation of the kitchens and bathrooms, new heating system, ventilation systems, and an elevator to make the upstairs meeting hall ADA compliant, among other items, but those are really the, the big ones. Uh, it is our hope uh, that uh, we will get this proposal. The board will evaluate it. If any board members uh, want to involve another engineering firm to get involved to present a proposal, we'll evaluate that as well. Uh, but ideally, we would like that planning process to be ongoing when the exterior work is done so that when this work is completed, we have this interior project teed up and ready to go out for bid and we can start it in this fall. So uh, that's the plan there, and we'll keep you posted as things progress. Uh, next up is a uh, whistleblower policy. We discussed this at our last meeting. Uh, this is a policy to make it easier, safer for employees to call deficiencies to the attention of management. This policy is intended to protect employees who make good faith claims of violations of our code of ethics from retaliation from other employees and managers or managers. The board has reviewed such a policy, which we believe would be appropriate for the district. I will now read, read it and make a motion to adopt it. Okay, so the Board of Fire Commissioners of the Fire District hereby adopts the following whistleblower policy. It is the policy of the Fire District to encourage employees and officers to report illegal or unethical practices. For the purpose of this policy, the term employee shall refer to both paid employees of the Fire District and volunteer firefighters of the Fire Department. Employees or officers who have a reason to believe or suspect that the Fire District, the Fire Department, their agents, employees, officers, or contractors are acting illegally or engaging in unethical practices or acting in a manner contrary to applicable laws must report such activity. Broad categories of suspect conduct include, but are not limited to, violation of law or government regulations, violation of fire district or fire department policy, mismanagement, waste of fire district, and the fire department and or taxpayer funds, abuse of personnel in the fire district, and the fire department and wrongful conduct. Some examples include, but are not limited to, dishonest acts and or fraudulent activity, harassment, discrimination, violation of controlled substance abuse laws, embezzlement, theft, destruction, removal, of conceal or, removal or concealment of property, alteration or falsification of paper or electronic documents, false claims and or misrepresentations of facts, violations of New York State or federal workplace safety laws and rules, and inappropriate use of computer systems, including hacking, software piracy, viewing and or sending unlawful or obscene emails or websites. Any of the issues of this type should be brought to the attention of the chief of department by the members of the fire department and to the chairman of the board of fire commissioners of the fire district by paid employees and district officers. If the chairman is involved in the complaint if the chief or chairman is involved in the complaint action, the employee or member may bring this matter to the attention of the other such officer. No officer or employee, including those of a contractor, may directly or indirectly use or attempt to use his or her official authority or influence for the purpose of intimidating, threatening, coercing, commanding, influencing, or attempting to intimidate, threaten, coerce, command, or influence any individual for the purpose of interfering with the right of such individual to disclose information relative to illegal activity or misconduct. Pursuant to this section, use or attempt to use official authority to influence includes promising to confer or conferring any benefit or threatening to effect any reprisal. We're almost there. The Board of Fire Commissioners shall cause such investigation to be conducted as may be appropriate. In investigating, best efforts shall be used to keep confidential the identity of the person providing the information which initiated the investigation unless it is determined that it will be necessary for that person to give testimony in a formal proceeding such as a disciplinary hearing or it is determined that the information was provided other than in good faith. The result of any investigation shall be reported to such other agency as deemed appropriate. The fire district will not tolerate any form of retaliation against an officer or an employee for raising concerns about practices within the fire district and the fire department. Nothing contained herein shall act to prevent such employee or officer from reporting e improper or illegal activities to law enforcement agencies or other agencies and authorities of the local, state, and federal governments, and this policy is not meant to dissuade employees and officers from such actions. 
This resolution shall take effect immediately. Do I have a second? You're making the motion? I'm making the motion. I'll second it. Okay, Dennis seconds. I'll poll the board. Stu. Aye. Anthony. Aye. I'm an aye. Dennis. Aye. And Tom. Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Okay, uh, the chief in his report uh, mentioned uh, an emergency repair to the Tuckahoe roof. Uh, Tuckahoe roof has uh, what's called a hose tower. I guess we used to hang hoses in there back in the day. Uh, pretty tall, I, I believe it's 40 feet, maybe a little bit yeah, maybe a little. more. Uh, we have a uh, copper roof on, on top of that structure. Uh, in one of the recent storms, the uh, copper was literally uh, blown off, uh, it, you know, uh, exposing the, the wood decking underneath. When it rains, water penetrates the tower, gets inside. Uh, this should be addressed as soon as possible. Uh, this, in my opinion, would be considered an emergency uh, repair. Uh, it, it was unexpected or hazard and could cause additional property damage if not repaired soon. Uh, the chief has received a number of, of bids to do this work. Uh, uh, two were closely bunched together, and then we had two outliers, uh, one that was so low as to be uh, considered questionable, uh, and another that was just so far above the other. Uh, the low bidder was uh, just, you know. What were the numbers? Uh, the numbers were 5,500, uh, 28,000. 28,000? 28,000, 29,000, and 75,000. Round sure them off. The lowest bidder realized it has to be bid with prevailing wage either. Because, I mean, he knows it's a government building, so I'll leave that up to him, but right. he's going to have to pay his employees. You know, because, because of the bid number, I actually contacted, you know, we specified that we wanted to use the same roofing materials. Uh, that we used when we did the Chester Heights roof. The reason being we had an engineer, uh, uh, you know, basically investigate all different types of roofs, what was appropriate, what had the longest life, uh, attractive, uh, you know, aesthetically appealing cost, everything. And we came up with this product called uh, EcoStar uh, Empire Slate Roofing. It's a synthetic roofing. So uh, we wanted to use that roof. Uh, I contacted uh, that manufacturer today just to discuss this bid and whether or not this was within the realm of, of realistic. And uh, the response was, you know, no. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is not a, a competitive bid situation. I do not believe, you know, uh, you know this is a situation, you know, it's an emergency repair. Uh, the next lowest bid uh, would be, uh, like I said, I don't have it in front of me, Brian. What was it exactly? 28? It's like 28.5, I believe. Yeah. Uh, with three bidders there. Uh, I would be in favor of, oh, by the way, that is to replace the entire roof. So take the copper off. We'll get some salvage value for that, which will reduce the cost. Uh, new ice shield, this synthetic roofing. They're going to put new uh, copper flashing on the chimney. There's a chimney up on that roof. Uh, Copper, copper drip edge. It's it's an involved process because of the height of the building, the access to it. Uh, I uh, would you know be in favor of of moving forward with that repair, uh, and would motion make a motion to do Can so. Give you the price and the materials. What it will cost just the materials? Uh, he he wouldn't give me the price of the materials alone. It, it's too dependent. Without knowing and seeing the roof now, how you know like the it's it's a uh, a square building it's 400 square feet and so there's different types of, of shingling that you're going to need and you know this was a phone conversation you didn't want to commit but just giving them the square footage and the roof design you know and and the other work that was being done and the height of the building and the need for you know scaffolding and and uh you know or pump jacks and, and that kind of thing he just thought it was was too low so What are you going with? Which bid? Uh, the next lowest bid uh, would be from Salvatore Roofing. 
and that is, do we have the exact number here? Because I don't want to. And, and who was the low bidder? Uh, don't think we need to. Yeah, you kind of do. Do we? Well, you don't have to do it, but we should kind of know who it is ourselves. We know. ASAR Roofing. ASAR. 28,000 even. It was 28,000 exactly. But the low bid was my grand. 5,500. Wouldn't bid it. You didn't bid? Wouldn't bid it. Oh. It would be our liability. We can't do it. Well, we know Salvatore's work. He's done work for us. Uh, he, he's done a, uh, an emergency repair on that firehouse a couple of weeks ago, right, Chief? So I think we should stick with Salvatore. We also did discuss in the future about working on that Tucko house as a whole, right? So this would not only put us in the right direction, but we would take care of that one segment with the type of roofing material that we eventually, I assume, want to cover all of our houses with when the time comes that the roofs are being replaced. So it will knock down, we'll save some money by replacing this hose tower from the rest of the project on the main building, maybe a year, two, or three from now. Right. Um, I, I'm, 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 in, I'm inclined to move forward. Yeah, listen, we could, just, you know, like it, this, this other bidder is a residential company. They don't have a footprint, they don't have a website. All the other bidders are commercial and residential operations who are vastly experienced in this, this type of work. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is uh, you know, to me, it's, it's an easy decision for me, uh, but. Was there a question? I didn't hear, I couldn't hear over here. Is there a question on the? Well, why would we turn down the substantially lower bid for a higher bid? I mean, if we're not, if we don't have any liability, if we're protected, mm -hmm. and a man saying that he can do the job at, at one quarter of the cost or even less. And three other bidders? I mean, I understand I mean, this, is, this is this is this is this is this is standard practice that you know again this is a little bit different than the stuff we put out for competitive bidding. I you know we haven't done there's a a, a possibility that or a likelihood that this wouldn't meet that qualification that this would not be the lowest responsible bidder responsible bidder there yes you have it. And, and, and so and and, and given given conversations with uh you know with again the, you know the manufacturer of uh, you know of the product that's going to be used uh the fact that you know these other bidders are reputable bidders that have been vetted Yeah, I mean, we picked first. them off. That's what I'm saying. My, my we other, should never ask I was trying to get multiple bids. My yeah. other um, concern with that, just to, to speak my piece, is that we've had repairs done to that roof, which have cost several thousands of dollars to repair. We're looking at a bidder who has submitted for an emergency project a $5,500 bid for, a basic, for an actual roof rip, and then a replacement of product plus the addition of the copper border around the chimney, it seems to me that between scaffolding and just the shingles, you're almost at that $5,500 mark, that I would be concerned in us holding him to the $5,500 and running into an issue where we thought we may have had with Chester Heights exterior and have to hold someone to lose money on a project if they've started and find out oh, this is gonna cost me 15, thousand dollars more just for materials and we have to make them go into a, a debt not a you know, total debt but a debt to finish the project I, I would looking at the height of the building I mean they're talking three and a half stories up probably right how many how many stories and up? There's, there's roof around sections of, yeah, this is I mean if it's 40 this, feet you're, 40, you're, I would be surprised up. anybody could do, just you're close to four stories almost would, five yeah. stories of that I would be shocked the guy could do it for that amount of money no but way. I'm also I wonder how much is don't know how you handle the quagmire or what he put us in. Exactly. In other words, if we, if we go to Salvador, hundred would be a, probably a great profit. <laughs> how much is this scaffolding going to cost? Could somebody well, well, no. Here's the question: A gentleman gave us a bid. We feel that it's an incompetent bid, 
so we're not going to take it. Does he have any recourse against us for, you know, can he say, hey, I wanted to lose money for you guys? No. 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 So, sure, so we, no, there's no danger to the board for, for, for accept it, not accepting low bid because it's unrealistic. We we're, we're definitely have the right to do that. I move we go with there's, Salvador. There's just no yeah. demonstrated capability for this type of work Perfect. from Which this exact, mover. That's how and this is a dangerous job with, you know, rights <coughs> involved and everything else. And, you know, the one benefit of Salvatore, even though the other guys who bid, is that we have vetted Salvatore right, already. We have, we've, right. we've done extensive vetting on him. He's worked for the district before. So this is, uh, you know. Yeah, but that doesn't help us with the low bidder claim. As long as we're protected legally because it just doesn't seem that, that it's even possible. All right, so how about we do this? How about we, uh, the board, empower me uh, or the chief uh, to uh, contract with Salvatore uh, I'll make the motion. Depend, you know. Uh, I'll make the motion, Peter. If, if, you know, our attorneys basically bless not using the, the low bidder. Well, I would, yeah, and, and, and the, I'm in that direction, but not there. I would say we make an attempt to contract the $5,500 and have him understand completely supply us with the materials cost sheet. What do you expect to spend on this materials? And when he tells you his materials are... $4,900, then he realizes right. that this is over. You're allowed yeah. to go buy, what you're I'm allowed to go I've, bind I've, ourselves. I've done this already. I've done the work. But, uh, you know, like if you want to take it on, I'm, I'm happy. No, I, I'm I, just saying, I don't know if we can jump to the, to the guy at, we have to get that roof. To the guy $23,000 higher without any, anything that documents that he's 23, he's, you know, uh, 23 over, he's, you know, 75% off the mark. It, it might be as simple as he thought he was going to take the copper. I don't know. He is going to take the copper. Both bids. No. Salvatore's leaving it. The other guy's taking it. Take it yeah. But we've already, again, we, I've done a takeoff on the copper, the square footage of how much copper there is, salvage value of copper. That copper is probably about $2 uh, a pound. It's, it's just... There's very close. Two dollars and forty-six cents. Yeah. All right. So there's there's very little value in that that copper that's going to move this thing over the top. But just one thing, the lowest bidder did mention. Uh, Commissioner Lori mentioned the scaffolding. He did say that he owns his own scaffolding, so he would not have to rent and have somebody else come install it. So he said that would be one reason that he thought he would have a good price, but I don't know if it's enough of a reason. Where is he from, Chief? I believe Lisa, what, White Plains, I believe. White Plains, okay. When we looked it up, yeah. He has other Guys, the, the, the bid okay. that we had had his company misspelled on, on the bid. The, the company name was misspelled. You know, we're, we're, we're talking about, I don't want to pursue this and have somebody fall, like, it's we're looking at creating a bigger headache for ourselves. No, if the attorneys it. bless it, let's just move on. As long as we're like, protected. This, is, this is, you know. I would like to All right, so we'll power the chief to do it with the, with the lawyer's blessing. Make your motion, I'm somebody second and I'll abstain. You got enough votes here. All right, uh, I'll make a motion uh, that uh, the chief can execute this contract uh, subject to approval by our attorneys. Second. Okay, Paul the board. Stu. Aye. Anthony. Aye. I'm an aye. Stain. I'm an aye. Okay. And that's the $28,000 yes. contract. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> what well, we're basically asking the lowest lowest is that we can right. skip the first one because we don't believe it's capable of being fulfilled. Okay. Uh, uh, what do I want to do next? All right. Uh, just quickly, uh, last uh, week uh, we had a gentleman come in. His name was James Rooney. Uh, he asked a question uh, about litigation costs uh, when we opened it up for comment. Uh, I did not have the information. I didn't want to give him a, a wrong answer, but I would like to follow up and just say that in 2017, the district spent $80,000 on six different matters that would be characterized as litigation or litigation prevention. 
Uh, of the $80,000, uh, 20000 of that has been awarded to us uh, back in fees uh, by a judge. We haven't collected the money, but there is 20000 that has been awarded. Uh, assuming we collect that money, uh, that would put our, our expenses at 60000 for litigation only now uh, last year. Uh, these are approximate, within a thousand bucks kind of thing. Uh, I will say that uh, several of the uh, matters that we were facing last year have been resolved or you know, decided, and at this precise point in time, we anticipate that our legal expenses for litigation will be less this year, year over year. Also, if you look at the litigation, <clears throat> the few pending cases we have right now, um, the one that the, commission, the chairman mentioned we're getting reimbursed on was the volunteer case uh, where we were the plaintiffs. So we brought the action and the courts have agreed to cover our legal bills. Um, on the other cases where the town sued us and the uh, former attorney sued us, um, we're the plaintiffs. So defendants. the defendants, excuse me, we're the defendants. Where those are, you know, that was we're just defending lawsuits that are brought against us, so it's not like as we spent uh, net sixty thousand dollars. The twenty thousand uh, dollars where we brought an action, we're getting paid back. The actions we're defending, we're just defending. So uh, I think that's important to point out. The reimbursement, yeah, the reimbursement for, is coming from the um, the volunteers have been the judges ordered them. Where were the we're, we're, well, we're, we're, we're the defendants, we're submitted claims to our insurance company to cover us. As the treasurer is pointing out, we do have liability insurance for those type of things. <clears throat> they won't pay for the judgment, they'll pay for the, for the legal work. So, so uh, next up is a uh, discussion of an ethics panel oh. that Stu's been working on. Okay, so at our last meeting, we had a brief introduction conversation uh, with the public indicating that we're going to be looking to move forward with an ethics panel made up of potentially community members everything is very much in a broad stroke process right now some information for the board to initially review has been put on paper um, I did bring copies tonight to hand out to anyone who wanted to take them home who may have not seen it on email to mark up and maybe bring them back to me and say Here's a line, I think I'd like to change this language, I'd like to add this language, anything like that, I thought that would be good. Just to speak to the panel portion of what we had been speaking of doing, this is right now a, a breathing document that can be edited. It has not been provided to our legal representation yet. I feel that we should woodshed it amongst ourselves figure out what we want it to look like, and then send it off to them for the real legal uh, s squeezing as far as put the nails to it, try and find out if everything we've put down in, on paper is appropriate, legal, within our right to do, whatever we, we want to pass, we can pass. Our attorney did mention to us earlier today that more sim he's more of a fan of simpler policies that are straightforward. Um, being that I am not an attorney, I think my language is straightforward. It could be maybe bolstered up in some areas, so any of the other four of you can certainly look at this and, and change, change language wherever you like. Um, I would like to just open it right now just for an initial discussion, just on the panel matter. The idea is this panel would be created to allow for us as commissioners to send matters that we believe as a board present some type of conflict in resolution that it we would benefit from an opinion being derived from a panel of three or five people who would again give us an opinion not a directive which we would then use and take into consideration when trying to formulate a decision it would be um, used as a board tool, not as a commissioner tool, not as a district tool by the chief or anyone else. It would be a board tool, which we would use together and we would discuss and potentially vote on to have these matters sent to that board. That was the initial layout of what I put together 
for the commissioners. If there's a discussion about that or anything along those lines, it, it's fine to have that in public session initially for sure. Um, I can take some notes or you can send it to me in an email format, whatever you feel like doing. Uh, but if anybody wants a hard copy of this, I'll, I'll pass it out to you after the meeting. Yeah. So, uh, I, if we can have a little discussion on it. The, <clears throat> the genesis of the panel comes from the code of ethics that was adopted by the board in 2007. The board adopted a code of ethics that was basically New York State Controller's Office came out with a model code of ethics in 2007. In that model code of ethics, um, it advised that you should form a panel to, um, to adjudicate basically and come out with informal advisory opinions if there was a question that came up. And, the, and it's for basically all employees or anyone to bring questions to the panel to have the panel answer and not to have a gatekeeper between the employee or the board and the panel as I read our own guidelines. Um, what New York State did in 2006 and there's laws of New York in, the, in a special law in 2006, they basically took New York State law for a model code of, for code of ethics and put a comma in and added fire districts. So they just included fire districts in New York State's pre-existing law for um, code of ethics. And then they circulated a model code of ethics, which we adopted all except for one part. Um, and that code of, and that's what Commissioner Rabin has been, um, would like us to get this. When you look at this, uh, it's called Section 13, uh, the Board of Ethics in the Code of Ethics. And so it's basically for, for, for all employees of the department or anyone with a question to come to the, to the Board of Ethics with, not to the fire board. So the board will not be the gatekeeper of who goes to the Board of Ethics. And it'll be the, for that panel to decide. That's how our Code of Ethics is written today. Um, and that's how the model is. So, but what I'd like to do, and I know you want to do more this next month, right? We want to- Yeah, we're not, but I would want to just say one thing. I'm under the impression initially that the reasoning the board was going to be moving forward with this specific panel was to eliminate our need to rely on our legal representation for settling issues of conflict amongst board members initially and for those matters that affected us. If there was another panel in our code of ethics that allowed for anyone in the district to visit, that panel is already in existence. This panel was being requested, or I think would be the right word, by our legal representation to come up with in order to settle what happens up here specifically. No, I, I So I, that, or we would have to go and buy, or buy, or, or invest more money into an additional legal representation or use the county, which has not been receptive. Well, way back to our September 11th meeting, we had people approach and talk about conflict and bringing, we brought up the idea of a community panel, and it was something that was focused on what was transpiring amongst board members or commissioners at the time, not about local 916 or the volunteers. I mean, I would, if we have a panel on our ethics code and it hasn't been used, that, you know, shame on us yeah, for those the, matters. It's in the ethics code. In the ethics code, the volunteer, New York State law spells out volunteer fire companies and, fire to put, and the fire district. So the volunteers within the fire district fall under this code of ethics. Right. So do all employees and every, all board members and all, just everybody does. And if there's a question under the board of ethics, if somebody thought there was a question, you should be able to go to an ethics panel and ask the ethics panel to opine. Our law firm was saying, your code of ethics calls for an ethics panel. Where's your ethics panel? You need to appoint one. So the ethics panel is for anybody to go to with a question about an issue. Is and the ethics panel defined in there? Yes. So we don't have one, though? Correct. It's defined as three members. And one of them is supposed to be an elected official, not within the district, within right. the town. And, a board member. and uh, so that is defined, and that just came out of the model. New York State sent us a model. You fill in your name, and that's how you got your ethics panel. We modified one section of this because we had board members at the time who had 
um, children, or not children, um, relatives who worked for the fire district, the son in, in this particular case. And we had a couple of commissioners who were former members of the department who were getting legal reimbursement as in former employees. So we had to modify a couple sections where it said um, they were getting um, stuff derived from a CBA that that wasn't a conflict, which we did. But we, we modified too much, I believe, and I'd like to address this next month, um, the term family member, and this is very important. Under the, well, let's, I, no, but, let me finish but, what I'm no, saying. Here, but you can bring it up, but let's finish the discussion on the panel, which is where we are. This, this is, is the discussion. But it's no, this is, this is different. No. This is on the Code of Ethics, and you should raise it no, later. You'll have an opportunity. The same ball of wax. It's we'll not. Raise it now. It's not, because... Peter, what don't I, stay for me. Let me finish what I'm saying. Dennis, I want to stay on topic. It I'm is about the panel. Topic. You could raise it later. But what I'm saying is that Stu now has presented this issue about an ethics panel for the board, and he's absolutely right. This is, I agree with you that, that this is, this is I understand that, but that does not stop the board from creating a new separate panel to handle ethical questions arising on the board. No. We certainly can do no. that. No, no you cannot. We can, we can pass a resolution no. to do that. The no. way we can pass, listen, this was already described to us by, by council. If I'm wrong, <clears throat> you can correct the, the record next month because we'll get council involved. But my point is this, we in my four and change years on the board now, we've never had one uh, member of 916, uh, our chief, our assistant chief or administrative staff come up with an issue regarding, you know, an ethical concern and for an opinion. And, but we have had amongst board members, those questions raised multiple times. And that is why we got to the point where we started to look at formation of a panel and what Stu has been spending his time on to basically, uh, you know, hear this, the, these cases and, and opine on, on whether or not they think a, a conflict truly exists. This, and I, I support that. And I hear what you're saying. I agree that that does say we should have a panel. But that doesn't mean that we can't have a panel. It's like you've been, you know, promoting hiring ethics counsel. Okay, or having paying lawyers. This was recommended to us by our attorneys as an alternative. No, it was and not. we said they also told us the board no, of not. the county board of ethics used those guys. We reached out to those guys multiple times. They didn't respond. If you, I circulated, I circulated a brochure from New York State Controller's office, uh, basically from the guy who's con who resigned today for allegedly beating his wife. But that was the controller had sent that out um, who said you shouldn't use the county a county's not allowed to opine on local boards I think that that's what the controller's office said they don't want the county opining on local boards but our law firm very clearly stated you guys have a code of ethics in your code of ethics you have a legal panel you have a panel that should be in there you should be going to your panel to resolve your problems your panel as described in your code of ethics. That's what we're referring to. Now, I'm referring to, we have a New York State model code of ethics except for one line that's very critical we change. Right now, family member is designed in our code of ethics, meaning child under the age of 21 or dependent household member. That's our code of ethics. The model code of ethics for fire district states, a family member means a parent, sibling, spouse, child, uncle, aunt, first cousin, or household member, meaning it's a broader definition to be more protective, and this is the New York State model for what a fire district should have. If I go to New York State model for what a local government should have, it's more inclusive. New York State for local governments model program, model Code of Ethics calls for a rel meaning, relative, means spouse, parent, step-parent, sibling, step-sibling, sibling, spouse, child, step-child, uncle, aunt, nephew, niece, first cousin, or household member of a municipal officer or employee, and individual having any of these relations to a spouse of the officer or employee. That's much broader. Ours, again, says only in covers 
child under the age of 21 dependent household member. That will become very critical at next month's conversation. So therefore, I think we should amend our code of accident at the next month's meeting with incorporating only what it says in the New York State um, model for fire districts. In the model for New York State model for governments, local governments, which is us, <coughs> we're similar to a local government, we spend $16 million, they have a nepotism clause. Their nepotism clause has one line that I think is beautifully worded. No municipal officer or employee, either individually or as a member of a board, may participate in any decision specifically to appoint, hire, promote, discipline, or discharge a relative for any portion at or within the municipality or on a municipal board. You could incorporate that nepotism clause in our policy, or you can incorporate simply New York State's model for fire districts. Our code right now is simply inadequate. It, it's adequate in all sections except that item B. We could fix it with one resolution and three votes, and we move on with our code of ethics to be fixed. At the same time, we look to get volunteers. We need three people in the community basically to volunteer to hear ethical questions, and that's it. Okay. I, uh, I, I think that's, you know, uh, sounds like something that's, that's worth investigating, and I think everybody is going to, you know, review it and carefully consider it over the next month, and, you know, you can propose the motion. We'll see how we go. I think it's a, a good idea. I will also say, though, I, I, if, you know, and I think if we're making changes, I believe we should also be making changes to our code of ethics uh, with regards to specifically uh, how that panel is created and how it's accessed. And that is what Stu has been working on. And I think that, you know, this concept that we're going to create an ethics panel and any one of our uh, 78 employees or five commissioners can unilaterally uh, go to a group of civilian volunteers and pose any question they want at any time is just not a workable uh, or realistic scenario. There has to be a mechanism for these issues to be vetted on some level uh, before they get passed on to a, an ethics panel. And so I would also propose, and I'll, I'll, I'll work on that, uh, that we make those modifications uh, and a motion to, to adopt that kind of language as well. And that dovetails well because that's what Stu has been doing. That's what he's been working on. So, uh, you know, well, I, I, I agree. The model code, listen, Dennis, I have said to you before, I mean, I was the one in our meetings last summer that, that talked about, you know, uh, my own uh, actions and that they conform, you know, conformed to the uh, New York State model code. So, I, you know, in principle, I agree with you. I think it's, uh, you know, now, I have one comment, if I could, Be because it, it sounds to me, you know, that our legal hasn't recommended, but is really telling us we have a code of ethics that tells us we have a panel, it does. a panel that doesn't exist, and, and we have to establish that panel. Correct. That's basically where we're at. Totally. I think that we're simultaneously establishing the panel and also rewriting how that panel is composed because we've not exactly. used it. Exactly. And. I think it is prudent for us to put that panel in place because it can begin to alleviate uh, a lot of the questions that board members have been having moving forward. I was only charged in looking f into the panel matter uh, through our discussions based upon what Kuglin and Gerhardt were asking. The last time we did anything regarding our code of ethics, I believe, was in January of 17, where we made a change where we were going to require everyone <coughs> in the district to sign a copy of the Code of Ethics. Has that been done? Have we all? I think we just emailed I've it. never signed it. We, we, no, but we that's all what, affirmed what, it this year. Right. I said to everybody, it. and we all affirmed that we had read it. So, yeah. Right. But mm -hmm. in January of 17, there was a motion that it had to, there are, um, our lawyers had recommended that that code of ethics be signed by everyone in the district. And it, it's just, I appreciate the idea that some things run their course and become outdated and some things become more important than others. 
I think this is a good opportunity for us to definitely look through our code of ethics and make changes, but I don't think we have to make those changes simultaneously. I think we can alter that document as we move forward. I think there is validity to what Dennis is saying. I think there's also validity in putting together a panel that has a little bit more structure and definition and something that may be more appropriate for the climate that we live in these days versus possibly 20 years ago in this specific district. I don't think personally, and I put it in here, I don't believe that another elected official from another municipality should be on an ethics panel for the fire district. I don't think that that, I personally do not believe that that's appropriate, that a council person in the town or a trustee from the villages would sit on this board because I, not only because I don't believe a fire commissioner would be invited to sit on an ethics panel for one of those municipalities, but I think it's more important to have the public who are not only taxpayers like those elected officials, but also somebody who may actually come to a meeting who would take a vested interest in how we steer this district a little bit more than somebody who has their plate full with their own municipality. So I, in, in my, as you'll see in my mock-up of what I've passed out over email and what's available here, I've actually asked or requested that that be one of the, one of the, the taboo requirements, if you will, or something that would not require or allow someone to gain access onto the panel, uh, aside from related matters. I mean, I think I just made a blanket statement here that they just could not be related to a commissioner, period. <laughs> it, it could be more specific, but it was just a blanket, you know, a, a wife or a spouse, obviously, of a commissioner. We'd have to approve the person going on anyway. So if we found a conflict within the conflict panel, we would be able to root that out. But three-fifths rules, right? So you never know. But th that was definitely something I was... I misspoke a few minutes ago when I said the Attorney General of New York with the, with the wife thing. It's uh, his girlfriends or mistresses or whatever. Oh. Um, here, what are I going to say? Um, I'm going to read this for a second. The Board of Ethics shall render advisory opinions to officers, employees, fire department members with respect to Article 18 of New York State General Municipal Law and this... Code of Ethics. Such advisory opinions must be rendered pursuant to written request of any such officer, employee, fire department member under such rules and regulations as the Board of Ethics prescribes. Not the Board, the Board of Ethics. Now, if you look at the village of Bronxville has a Board of Ethics. Correct. And they have people that sit on it. Mm -hmm. And I would bet they get once every, you know, number of years somebody were to request. And I'm sure anybody can walk up and ask the question. I um, would think the town of Eastchester has a board of ethics that at times gets requests. I think you'll find out it's like having a policy for, you know, where you sign a policy or a whistleblower or any of those other policies we did, did tonight or, you know, um, workplace violence policies. There's no gatekeepers. There's no gatekeepers to the, to the policeman. This is the policeman and there's no gatekeepers. Okay. Two things I want to say here. First off is, you are recommending changes to the code of ethics and insisting that you know they're for the better of the board all i'm doing is agreeing with you and saying another change that needs to be made is that paragraph you just read i do not believe that that is a workable or a, a best practices uh way to handle ethical disputes so i want to modify that this has been written by the New York State Controller's Office over 10 years ago, and it hasn't been changed since they wrote it. Dennis, so I would think Dennis, they're pretty comfortable I with think, it. I think you're saying that, but we, I don't know that to be fact, and I don't think you know it to be fact either. Yeah, so I, I think we, you know, and as far as you say, Bronxville, you know, maybe they got one inquiry, two inquiries, you know, a year or something like that. You, I'm you, still doing research. So. Yeah, you, you've, you've raised issues about ethical conflicts on this board probably two dozen times in the last year. So I think that this is gonna be pretty active and that's why I'm saying there has to be some mechanism for somebody besides one person to unilaterally make, you know, what in my opinion at times have been, not all times, but at times have been baseless claims. And we don't wanna get, listen, we're gonna go out, we're gonna to try to get three whip smart attorneys from Bronxville, Tuckano and Eastchester to sit on this board. And I don't think we want to bog them down with nonsense any more than they want to do that. They want to come and they want to hear legitimate 
you know, issues of conflicts and deal with that on behalf They'll of their turn community. It down, then. They won't but, have all the, they, the chairman of that little committee. It's, I, I, I think agree. you need to read what this, what this guideline is and actually yes, read it. You're and talking understand about it. changing it. You are talking about that very same guideline. You're saying we got to change it. Because but you're picking and choosing the sections that no, you want to keep saying, and you want to change. I'm changing one part where we watered down to where it's totally useless, this document, because the next time we hire firemen, it'll become very relevant why I think we need this change. I and that, that, that is very important that this change gets made about next month's meeting. It will resolve a lot of issues, and it'll put this board in good standing. If we don't make that change at the June meeting, we are just opening up a can of worms. That's my view. I agree with Peter when he says that we need a mechanism. And I do think that the board right now is in good standing. If it's not, I haven't heard that yet, but I thought it was. Here, here's just an example, and it may be very outlandish, and Steve, you can't take this from me. But if local 916 pre six president Steve Ranalone decided to go to a panel that was available for any employee to go to and said, the Board of Commissioners has not come to the table and provided us with a new employment contract for a year. Don't you find that to be unethical because of everything that we do in our job every day? And we know how matters can escalate as far as contracts and negotiation. If he goes to a panel and we have three people on a panel who are, you know, soft to the idea and say, we agree, so we're going to render an opinion that says it's unethical in our opinion that you've not settled the contract. Although it's an opinion, not a directive, now we have something on paper that says we're being possibly unethical for not giving a cost of living increase to firefighters. And I think that's what we want to avoid. We want to be able to say, no, that's not an ethics panel matter. You have an attorney. The board believes that you should go and speak to them and have that attorney speak to our attorney, not go to our ethics panel and get a position to present in a hearing or mediation that says, we believe that they're acting unethical. I think that's what we're trying to avoid. In, in but that. I think you're, you're, you're no intelligent group of people that you're picking for this panel would go down that road. I think people are more sophisticated than that. Um, you never know. Yeah, I, I, yeah, but I think they are. And so I, I just look at New York State crafted a model code of ethics. I'm sure they had a group of attorneys that did it. And we should just go back to what the model code of ethics said and not have it amended. It's that simple. Or pick the code of ethics for our local governments and use that model code of ethics. But so right now we have a code that of we ethics. Should keep the elected official on the board based upon whatever it says there. Excuse me. Do you think that we should keep the elected official on a panel like that code says there? Well, not. It won't be an elected official one of ours. It'll be from another. Yes, from another municipality. I think the reason Does it why say they another municipality it just says an elected official. Yeah, but it says an elected official it won't be one of us. No, no, I understand that. But does it say an elected official within the municipality or an elected official in general? Like it'll be in the, the township, of the I believe. The United States serve on it. I don't know, but I think okay. they. I think well, that'd be an important thing to find out because, like I said, I don't think we would want uh, the mayor of Bronxville or Tucko or the supervisor to be on that panel. They would never do it, but, but that's the. Well, you never know. But you well, would... one or two times a year, who knows, yeah. right? Yeah, but you see my point. My point is... I understand, but my, my, what, the point that I'm getting to now is that if we're not going to edit that for the sake of providing a better uh, passage of language for the ethics panel, then maybe we shouldn't be editing anything and you know, just empower that panel to start. No, you need to edit this panel. You need to edit the one line next month. But it you is need to end a family member. That's what everybody's getting. I, I think maybe it's a, a motion to move on. Uh, no, how are we going to get these names? You know, how are we going to put a pool it's of names? It's all in your email. Okay. And I have a copy here to give you. Here's why yeah. you want to adopt so let's do it next that. month. Let, let's move You're to that part. Solve it but we now. can't get to that part. We can't. We can't solicit anyone until we create this panel or do a revision or whatever it is. We can't even get to that point. If you modify this next month. All right, <coughs> and it becomes relative very quickly why we want to modify it by next month. If we don't have an ethics panel in place, it puts more onus on the person who, to comply with the New York State guidelines, and therefore your problems go away. In the ethics panel, you won't have a problem. In other words, if you have a strong code, you don't have a problem. People don't try to wiggle between it. That's my point. I, I understand that's your opinion. I, I understand that. I do. 
um, we're at a point now where this idea of a panel has been floating out there since September, and it's May, and we're finally making some headway, and it seems like it's being diverted for other things. And I understand that everyone has a right to look into those things, but if we're not going to do an ethics panel and we're going to say that this work is not necessary, then we need to enact that panel next month because we've already adopted it as a code of ethics. So we need to move forward with what that language is and have that ethics panel put into our service. If we already have it adopted and we're not going to adopt a caveat to that, then we need to then move forward with that as a board or reject the idea of forming, or f forming we, it again. We could yes. adopt right now and put the one line to bed. We can't because nobody's reviewed that, obviously. Well, like pass you around. So it's not an, five it's minutes not an to read it. vote. But we could, you could put that one line to bed right now. Put that part away. Your ethics panel is not going to get formed. With all best efforts, that panel is not going to get formed for the next six months. By the time you get around to drafting the language, finding people, interviewing them, you're five or six months down the road. You are. You're not next month. I feel like a lot of the language has been drafted. It just needs to have the. You still have to find the. Like no, it's. No, I think you need to correct our current ethics panel before we compromise the integrity of this but board. Dennis, you're bringing this up, though, kind of catching everybody off guard. You mentioned it briefly in there. Like, if you want to make a motion, make it. But I'm not certainly going to vote for anything that I haven't had time to carefully consider. You're bringing this up here, you know, like. Just, it's, it's not the right way to, to do it. Um, I'm, no, I'm bringing it up like this. I'm saying in June, you have between now and the June meeting to look at the New York State Model Code of Ethics. And I think we will all do that. I'm confident that this board will, one, will, will look at this and carefully consider And we change the suggesting. one line. I think, we change you know, that uh, one line. I, nobody's, I don't hear anybody disagreeing with that. Just saying, we're not doing it tonight. Okay, uh, I think we're nearing the end. <laughs> well, we haven't had one <laughs> for next month's meeting as well. Can I just bring up one more thing for next month's meeting? Uh, Would you like to start the budget oh, oh. discussion for next month. All right. Well, I was going to have board comments at the end. So, okay. Okay. did public nine one six anything to say? <laughs> <laughs> I want to go home and go to bed. That's what uh, okay. So, uh, I got some comments. Yep. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, on May 20th, the volunteers are having the memorial service at the Assumption Church at 9 a.m. All board members are invited, as well as the locals. Uh, Steve, you know, I told you. Um, Lisa and Jamie, you also are invited. After Mass, we'll have a memorial service at the monument. And, um, the veterans will do their firing squad there, and then we're having breakfast at Fogarty's in Bronxville. On May 28th, a memorial service by the Veterans Association uh, is taking place at East Chester High School Auditorium at 7 p.m. All are welcome, <coughs> and it's gonna be doing it for the 100 year of the World War I is gonna be the main topic. And after the service, they're going to go to the bottom of Stewart Avenue and do a brief ceremony at the Veterans Monument on the corner of Stewart and uh, Post Road. On May 29th is the Bronxville Parade, starting at 9 a.m. After the parade, there's a ceremony in front of the uh, Bronxville High School. And after that ceremony is completed, they're going to go to the cemetery behind the Village Hall and do a, uh, the veterans are doing a firing squad. Today, a lot of people don't know it, but it's a very important day. Today's the day the war ended in Europe on May 8th. And I hope that after the meeting, we could have a mo moment of silence for all those innocent people who were murdered, shot to death, and um, for thank our servicemen for saving ourselves and that we're able to speak English today after what the American servicemen did. and. Um, that's why I ask for a moment of silence after today's um, meeting. The war's been over since 1945. And that's just a little tribute we could do for those servicemen who gave the ultimate uh, sacrifice and for all those innocent people who were killed. That's my report. 
Anyone else have anything they want to add? Well, I do have a comment because I found out this month through an email that the commissioners received from someone who's doing research. The Eastchester Fire Department is the third busiest fire department in southern Westchester. So congratulations, it's just the fire department. I don't think we were so busy. Uh, I, I suppose because a lot of the other departments don't do the uh, emergency medical service runs that we do, but- uh, That's towns and villages. That doesn't include the cities like Yonkers, New Rochelle, and right, Lake Plains. Right, of course, so, yeah. yeah. I think you did, yeah. Okay. I think I, I just want to oh, one thing. Uh, last Friday, uh, Commissioner Lori and myself were able to attend the local 916 dinner, honoring some of our firefighters who have given 20 years of their lives to serve the community as firefighters, and also to recognize the retirement of firefighter Esposito. Uh, I just wanted to say that thank you again for inviting us. Those who were able to attend did come. It was a great time. You guys always do a wonderful job organizing the event. Uh, the speeches were a little bit shorter this year than last year, but it was definitely great. Um, I'm more than happy to go ahead and read the names of the people who were honored for their 20 years of service. Uh, Firefighter Kapoor, Martinez, Firefighter Rogliano, Firefighter Hall, Firefighter O'Leary, Firefighter Albanese, Firefighter Francis O'Rourke III, Firefighter Samodis, and Firefighter Chiapa, and again, uh, Robert Esposito. We wish, we wish him the best of luck in his retirement. And uh, thanks again. Okay. Uh, I was going to say, if we can, next month in June, we should start thinking about the budget for September. I mean, I know it's early, but we should think about major items that we want to change, alter, adjust. I would like to float the idea of bringing back the assistant chief. Um, just I, at the next budget meeting, which I know will be a budgetary item. So that's my thoughts for next month's meeting. Okay, uh, so we're gonna make a motion to adjourn and we'll have a moment of silence uh, for the end of the war. Uh, so, uh, make a motion. Sushnu, Anthony. Aye. Okay, I'll pull the board. Everybody's aye, aye, aye. All right, and now, moment of silence. <laughs>